Wow. Okay. So I don't know if uh, like that was an extraordinary Myrtle. I know she's somewhere there. Thank you, Myrtle and Martin. Um, I'm very excited to have another person who um, captured my imagination. Um, and this is Louis Pugh, who is a UN ambassador for the oceans and endurance swimmer. And the first time I saw Lewis um, was probably in an image that most of you have seen, um, or maybe not seen, but when you see it, it stays in your mind forever. Um, and Lewis is going to be sharing some stories today with us, and this is the image that I'm talking about, Lewis. Talk, talk me through, what do you do and what are you doing here? Uh, so this is uh, 2007, I'm undertaking the first long distance swim across the North Pole, and I was... Uh, <laughs> yes, 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 just across the North Pole, as you do. Yes. yes. So I, I remember this moment quite well because I was there with an Australian photographer called Jason Roberts. And how do you convey a message about what's happening at the North Pole? And I said to him just before we jumped in, I said, put a fisheye lens onto the camera to create that curvature because you've been to the North Pole, you know what it's like. It's completely flat everywhere. Yeah. And all I'm trying to do is tell a story about what's happening there. This is 2007. Uh, a large melt in the Arctic. We had sailed there. We got to the North Pole, and everywhere there were these masses, massive open patches of sea. Mm. And I'm now going to do a kilometer swim across the North Pole. I would say that this photo sort of almost changed the trajectory of your life, mm. in a way. Is that a fair it's thing a bit, to say? Yes. I mean, you were on that path, but it amplified something that needed to be amplified, and obviously you were the messenger. I remember my doctor saying to me that he'd only ever seen two people go into a sporting event as one person and come out a completely different person. The one was Joel Stransky, you may have remembered in the World Cup 1995, All Blacks versus the Springboks. He kicked the winning goal in the final minutes for South Africa to win the World Cup. Nelson Mandela was there. He said he went in as one person, he came out a completely different person. I would say I came out of there with a deep, deep resolution that what is happening there in the Arctic now is so serious, it's so fast moving, yeah. that this is now uh, a deep purpose now to highlight what is happening there. So I did my training on the edge of the Arctic ice packs, north of the island of Spitsbergen. When I did that training, the water was three degrees. I went back there recently, it's now 10 degrees centigrade. I mean, that says it all, doesn't it? It says it, it says and it And you all. only need one degree, <laughs> as you know, to change water to ice, etc. Mm -hmm. and, and at 10 degrees, mm -hmm. that means we're, we're in serious trouble. Yeah. Um, so, let me ask you this, because I'm sure everyone wants to know this. That moment when you're standing mm -hmm. on the edge of whatever it is, an ice flow block, what's going through your mind? You've got to try and get all the, the fear out of your mind. So the world is divided between pioneers and fo followers. You're either a pioneer or you're a follower, and you can't be both. And if you're a pioneer, all the risk, all the worry is on your shoulders because nobody has ever been in there before. Mm. And I remember that angst inside my stomach and thinking to myself, you know, I'd never swum in minus 1.7 before. Nobody had. And just that fear inside me, and it, and it starts building up, building up, building up. And then I had one of the worst possible thoughts you could have. I thought to myself, if things go horribly wrong now, how long will it take for my frozen corpse to sink the four and a half kilometers all the way to the bottom of the Arctic Ocean? Wow. This is uh, an interesting shot. Um, you've got a nice backdrop. Yes. What, what's going on here behind you? Well, what's interesting is what's in front of me. You can see all those bubbles. Yeah. That's me trying to get to the lead of the expedition who's going to pull me out. This is three years later. It's on Mount Everest. So this is a glacial lake on Mount Everest. I'm there highlighting the impact of ice on land rather than sea ice yeah. and how important this ice is in the Himalayas. Yeah. This ice provides water to India, China, Pakistan, yeah. Uh, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Nepal, mm. millions and millions and millions of people rely on it. Yeah. And it's disappearing. And it's disappearing. At an alarming rate. And the water's not yeah. just for drinking. No, it's everything. It's for agriculture, it's for industry, it's for... Life. It's for life. It's for life. Yeah, no water, no, no life. life. Yeah. Um, and so, 
this sort of thing, I mean, we had a conversation about you have people around you yes. who obviously have to keep an eye on you. Yes. Because you clearly just as someone who just goes and does extreme things and extreme environments. And yeah. the dangers have got to be enormous. Yes. But I, I, from what I know of you, you're willing to die for a cause. Not that you're going to die, but you're willing, you're putting your life on the line. We talked about this. You are, every moment that you're in one of these environments could be your last, but you think it's this is so important. This is the most extreme environment you could be in. Yeah. We'll come now to a couple of pictures where I've just been in Greenland and swimming day after day after day. If you could just go back one slide, thanks. Um, no. Oh, okay. Um, when you, Water is an interesting thing. So yeah. between 100, sorry, between 0 and 100, it's a liquid. Yeah. Above 100, it becomes a gas. Below 0, mm. it becomes a solid. And so there's actually a tipping point at yeah. which everything completely changes. changes. Yeah. And when you get into water which is below 0, you know it. And your body starts changing and it starts changing really, really quickly. I have absolutely no death wish. This is about life. Yeah. This is about highlighting what is happening here and trying to get action. This is an extraordinary image. This is in Greenland, right? Oh, no, this is in the Arctic. No, it? this is down in Antarctica. Oh, okay. So, th so this is in, right, in so. uh, East Antarctica. I got it right in the end, didn't I? I couldn't have got <laughs> Greenland, Arctic, somewhere. <laughs> this is the most extreme environment you could be. So when we arrived there, so scientists have discovered all these super glacial lakes yep. all over the ice sheet. And these supraglacial lakes, they meet up, they become rivers, and then they start drilling their way all the way down to the, to the bedrock. There it lubricates the bedrock and makes the ice sheet unstable. How do you tell a story about that? <laughs> yeah. This, to me, tells everything. Yeah. Uh, and I remember standing at the beginning of the tunnel, and we had seen that this tunnel went through the mountain and came out the other side, about a kilometer away. And once you enter that tunnel, the water is flowing. And it would have been impossible, virtually impossible, to swim against it. So if there's an ice fall, th this is a high consequence environment. And I feel so strongly about this issue. Mm. Our futures will be determined in the polar regions by what's happening right now. So I went down there, and I remember standing at the mouth of the tunnel. And I say a short prayer, and then I go for it. And it was the most extraordinary swim I've ever undertaken because the colors were so vibrant. Mm. So the light is shining through the ice. And it went from this beautiful sort of uh, light blue into a dark blue, and then into a pink, and then into a purple, and then into a violet. And then in the middle of the tunnel, it was so dark, I had to take my goggles off my face. And I'm absolutely freezing. So I was going to say, you have that much awareness that you need to take your goggles. I mean, you had to do that. Because as I was coming around the corners, yeah. you have all these stalactites hanging down. And it's quite easy to put your hand into one of them and you'll slice yourself. So I took the goggles off and I started swimming. And then I thought to myself, slow down. Mm. Stop. Just have a look at this. And I slowed down. Because I know that I'm the first person that's been in here. Yeah. I'm probably the last person that would ever come in here. And then I heard this almighty crack. You know, when ice moves, yes. it makes such a terrifying sound if you're underneath it. Yeah. And I just said, get on with this. And I came out the other side, and there was my Russian friend, Slava Fetisov, and he picked me up and he pulled me out. And I've never been more relieved. That, that's probably the most dangerous swim I've done. Everybody needs a Russian friend to pull you out. I mean, we, if you don't have a Russian friend to pull you out, I mean... <laughs> Of, of a situation like this, but it, there's something extraordinary because some people might be thinking, okay, cool, this guy's certifiably mad, and you know, and, and they're looking at the image. But you've done something extraordinary mm. with this storytelling. I mean, extraordinary. Yeah. You've been responsible for doing something which I think you should tell everyone about with yeah. marine protected reserves yeah. and how this has transformed the way people look at these regions. Mm. I, I, mean, I mean, just to clarify something, yeah. I don't think I'm mad, okay? I think I'm normal, yeah. and I really mean that in the deepest possible sense. <laughs> but I look at what is happening to the world right now, yeah. and I look at what's happening there in COP26, mm. and I realize that there are a lot of people who are taking enormous risks with our lives and this planet. Yeah, I agree. They are mad. Well said. Yeah. I agree.
agreed to that one. Yeah. This is one of my most favorite places in the whole world. This is Miru in the Maldives. Now we're talking, now we're back to yeah, some yeah. normality. <laughs> and I remember diving in here and I'm swimming from Miru to uh, Male, the capital city. And it's, I don't know, it's about a 10, 20 kilometer swim. And I dived in and underneath me are all these tropical fish and the colors are so beautiful. The purples, the yellows, the reds. And there's a big manta ray in front of me and these small little reef sharks coming along. And the colors of the reef are so beautiful. And I just swim along the edge and I can see as a, as a blue just goes all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. And I swam for day after day after day. I, di I did a, uh, I think, 130 kilometer swim along this reef system here. I went back there a couple of years ago. The water temperature has risen just a little bit. And on this specific island that I was staying, there were the people building the sandbags to try and protect this place. So the coral reef has died, the fish have disappeared, and that coral which provides the defense for these people and this island, gone. Yeah. And that is the case that we're seeing. I mean, this is how this is all interconnected, right? I mean, mm. We hear about it, and, and it is. It's the web of life, you know, ice melt, sea level rise, yep. it's real. Yep. They're making a plan to remove the whole nation, to find somewhere else to go, because they know that it's inevitable. Yes. It's not an if, it's but not it's a when. And it was very, very interesting <coughs> to listen to Prime, uh, President Nasheed, who used to be the president of the Maldives, speaking. So I heard him speaking uh, in Paris, and he was saying to the world, please help me save my nation. Mm. I mean, he came back this year, it's not that. He says, please help save yourselves. Yeah. I mean, I think that sums it up, doesn't it? Mm. And I think what you're saying is, is, is we've got to make these changes quickly. And I think you are you know, one of these levers. We had Bertrand Picard here yesterday. Who's yes. one I, there's a great saying, um, Buckminster Fuller, who is an incredible, uh, sort of coined the phrase Spaceship Earth. Um, on his tombstone, it says, I was a trim tab. You know? And a trim tab is the tiny little bit on the wing that makes the rudder move and then makes the whole thing move. And I see you as, a, as I said to Bertrand, you're a trim tab. That's very kind, thank you. You make those movements. Mm. And then it ripples out because we're waiting or the world looks at the leadership. But actually, it's individuals like you and Myrtle and Will Steger, who's in here, and many others who will be coming through this space that are actually changing the way that we view oceans and, and protect them and the interconnectedness. And so your, is your role as a UN ambassador for the oceans, mm. how has that amplified your impact? And how do you find yourself now? Um, you know, w w is your day swimming still or is it sitting around persuading people that this is the most essential thing. How do you split your day and time? I like to start the day with swimming. Okay. Every day? Do you swim every day? I've tried, uh, the last two weeks I haven't been able to, but, but most days I start the day with swimming and it, and it, it brings a joy to me. Yeah. I've been swimming for 35 years. Yeah. 18 of those have now been in the polar regions, but I, I, I really love swimming. And I love the people who swim. Mm. It's a wonderful community of open, wa open water swimmers, which, yeah. which I really love. But it's now the work for representing the United Nations is, is the majority of the work which I do every single day. And when uh, the executive director of the UN Environment appointed me as the UN uh, patron of the oceans, he said, very, very simple job. We want you to be the voice of the oceans. We want you to be, you know, speaker up on behalf of all the magnificent wildlife that lives in them. So here I am on a beach in Dover. So uh, this was a few years ago. Uh, instead of swimming across the English Channel, it's 32 kilometers across the English Channel. About 2,000 people have done it, but nobody had ever swum the length of the English Channel, which is 528 kilometers. And so I went down to Land's End and I started this swim. And Sky News were giving me daily coverage. It was quite extraordinary, yeah. daily coverage. And right the way along this swim, I was saying to the British government, we need to properly protect the waters around the United Kingdom. Mm. Just seven square kilometers are properly protected. Mm. In the rest, you can drill for oil, you can drill for gas, you can have industrial fishing fleets coming through, the Royal Navy can do gunnery exercises. It, it's, it's, it's nothing short of disgraceful. Mm. Right? And so uh, I swam and I swam and I swam. And the, the first week was, was lovely, nice, flat, calm seas. I then got to Plymouth, where I grew up as a young boy, 120 kilometers across Lime Bay, and then I got to Portsmouth. 
and everything changed. It was literally storm after storm after storm. And eventually, after 49 days, I arrived in Dover. And there to meet me on the beach was Michael Gove. And he was the environment secretary at the time, and he said, Lewis, we've heard you. And I said to him, I said, Michael, I wish you'd heard me before I had to swim for 49 days. <laughs> He said, what do you need? I said, the science is really clear. We need to be protecting at least 30% of the world's oceans now by 2030. And the British government then agreed to that global target. They then went to the United Nations. They made the announcement. They encouraged other nations to follow suit. Yeah. Since then, 107 nations have joined. Amazing. Commitments are important. Yeah. But then you need to designate yeah. the marine protected areas. You need to ensure that they are in areas which are ecologically important, they need to be large, and you need the finance for them. They need to be marine protected areas. And so we've got our work cut out now over the next 10 years to get these across the line. What do you think about when you're swimming? <laughs> so this is a picture from South Georgia. You've been to South Georgia? I haven't been to South Georgia. Um, if I could have one last day on this earth, one last swim, it should probably be here in South Georgia. So it, it takes um, a That's couple quite of a statement. Yes. So people think I'd want a warm water swim, but it's probably here in South Georgia. So this is me near Grytviken, which is the, uh, the main town there. And behind me are all these king penguins. And to stand there on a beach and see these king penguins come ashore with their white chests and their gold bow ties and their black backs, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them flying in onto the beach and then they stand up mm. and then they waddle ashore and on the beach it's the noise and the it's it's like it's like being in the serengeti of of the southern ocean and you've got these huge great elephant seals fighting on the beaches it's an amazing place i'm down here now trying to get the british government to understand how important it is to protect this place at the moment, only 25% of South Georgia and the neighboring South Sandwich Islands are fully protected. This is the most important biodiversity hotspot under British jurisdiction. And all we've done is protect, fully protect 25%. Yeah, that's great. So what do I think during these swims? I learned something recently on this Greenland swim. The purpose will get you in the water, but it won't keep you in the water. And what I mean by that is that before the swim, I'm thinking about this campaign. So this one, to try and get this area properly, fully protected. There are some parts of the world which are so important. I think they're so magical that they should be left alone completely. South Georgia is one of those. Mm. Purpose will get you in the water, but it won't keep you in there. It is so painful during these swims. The fingers, the hands, yeah. the, the chest, everything. That the only way I can keep on going is with the team that's around me. And they, they keep me going. Amazing. There's, um, we actually did some studies into sort of, um, and, and one of the, we were looking at motivation and what motivates people, and, and, and purpose was one of them, but passion, mm. and also play. A what? A play. play. Mm. To play. When we grow up, mm. we, we forget to play, right? When we, we become adults, we, we become very serious and we forget to play. Um, yeah. And I think combining pa passion, purpose, and play together, and clearly you have the passion, clearly you've got the purpose. Um, I was thinking about the play piece because of the way the penguins come out. And the other night we had, a very, we had Andrew Steer from the Bezos Fund, and we asked everybody, what species would you be? And he fluctuated between a penguin and a seagull, and he chose a seagull. And I'm assuming that you might choose a penguin, or you could come back to that. But what species, if you were to give a voice to any species in the ocean that you swam alongside? Oh, that's unfair, because there's so many incredible species. Yeah. And, and one must remember that um, they're all interlinked. Sure. So you take one out, and it impacts all the others. And so down there around South Georgia, what's happening is the big industrial fishing fleets are taking out Antarctic toothfish. It's like white gold. Yeah. And they take it out, and that obviously that has a huge impact on the penguins and all the other animals down there. Um, I did a swim a number of years back in a place called Deception Island. Yeah. And I swam right in front of where was an old whaling station. 
And during the swim, when I was swimming across this bay, there were thousands and thousands of old whale bones there. So this is many, many years ago when the whaling fleets came there. They killed the whales. They dragged them into this bay, slaughtered them, and then melted them uh, in, these, in these big pots, which are still on the beach. And I like to think that those whale bones are a reminder of our potential for folly. Mm. But they're not. Mm. First we came for the whales and we took all of them. And then we came, uh, first we came for the seals and took all of them. Then we came for the whales and we took all of them. Now we're taking the Antarctic toothfish. We're even going down there and taking krill, the mm. tiniest life on which everything survives yeah. down there in the Southern Ocean. It's like we haven't learned our lesson. Yeah, we definitely haven't learned our lesson. You, talking of lessons, you're clearly teaching the world um, purpose, putting yourself on the line, you're, you're leading by example, mm -hmm. you're, you are an incredible human and um, if you had the chance to wave that wand, and I know that's not a silver bullet, but if you just could get something across that you would seed that would make that change, what would it be? What's the, what's the final message that you would like to say? So this picture here is me swimming across the face of the Alulasat Glacier. Uh, so this, I've just come back, this is a month ago, me swimming across the face of the Alulisac Glacier in Greenland. This was a 12-day swim. 12 days gives you a lot of time to be thinking about the message to world leaders. Yeah. Behind me are icebergs, some of which are a kilometre tall. And during that swim, I witnessed literally thousands and thousands and thousands of icebergs move off the glacier down this fjord and out to sea. Mm. That glacier is now moving at a speed of 40 meters per day. Wow. My message to world leaders is, we cannot dither any longer. It needs to be action, action, action. You go outside, the people are calling for it. The youth are calling for it. Yeah. Everybody knows it. Yeah. Consensus is important. Communication and working together as nations is important. But the most important thing, I think, is taking action. I'm urging world leaders, business leaders, political leaders, all of us, to take what I refer to as extreme ownership. Mm. Okay? And that is we must take 100% responsibility for our actions. Yeah. The biggest threat to the environment right now is the belief that somebody else is going to solve this problem, that some other country is going to cut its carbon emissions, that some other company is going to stop polluting the environment. My message to all of us is we need to take extreme ownership. Thank you, Lewis, for being that person, being that action man, being a voice for the ocean. And I hope that all of you have enjoyed this and will spread Lewis's message. Thank you. Thank you.